Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Hawker Road Adams channel here on YouTube. I'm your host, Drew Hare, with our analysts, Chris Adams and Matt Hawker Road. Say hi, guys. Hello. Chris Chris just waved. He didn't actually say hi, but he's here as well. So here we go. I actually did say hi. We both said hello at the exact same age. Did you? I just, I, just, I just saw your waves. Anyway, we are off to a great start here talking about the 2021 NFL uh, free agency review. But of course, we're going to start by talking about the big change that's really going to be impacting the 2021 season and beyond is the expansion into a 17 game season. Um, when you guys both heard the news, uh, what were your thoughts, especially since there's going to be just 17 games, but no additional bye weeks. It was my main takeaway. Yeah, my first thought was like, I'm going to have to relearn all of these records, right? Because like for so long, <laughs> we said like, okay, like 10 and six is like the standard playoff record. Mm -hmm. and like Seven and nine means you're kind of okay in rebuilding. And then like, you know, five and, you know, five and 11 and below is like, you're bad. You're, you're bad. Now it's like, all oh, changed. Like is 10 and seven good? I don't know. We'll find out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, obviously more football is always a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, like it does kind of feel a little shoehorned in. Um, it feels like 18 games would have made more sense if they could have got that done and just waited until they got that in the CBA or negotiated that instead of the 17 game schedule. Um, and odd numbers always weird. I, I mean, I think they tried to do the best they could with like trying to keep parity uh, by making all the AFC teams get an extra home game one year and all the NFC teams. So it doesn't like cause an unfair advantage to get into the playoffs. Um, but it, it's it still, I don't know. It just seems weird to add an extra NFC versus AFC game. Uh, if you're going to add an extra game, I mean, but I don't know any other way they could have done it. So, I mean, I think like they did the best they could to try to do this, but it still is weird. Um, like, I don't know. It just, Something about 17, an odd number of games just seems weird. Um, but, and I also am a little annoyed that they, uh, instead of getting rid of a preseason game and moving the whole schedule up a week, they just moved everything back and kept everything where it was. Yeah. So we're going to be playing this, the Super Bowl is going to be in the middle of February now. I mean, it was already like crazy late, but like, um, yeah, it's just going to be, it's, it, it almost seems like they were like, what's the way we can make this the most money? Uh, and they were like, well, if we move it back, then we can have more Saturday games. Like, cause we can't have mm -hmm. Saturday games during the NCAA. Cause that's a, like, that's a federal law. I think <laughs> it's weird. They can't have Friday and Saturday games uh, <laughs> as a federal law. It's really weird that that's the case, but, um, and uh, until like after they get through the regular season in college football. So, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just wonky. Hopefully they add that 18th game at some point in the near, near future. I know it's going to be like 10 years until the CBA is renegotiated, but maybe they can get that done on some addendum or something because 17 is weird. I mean, um, I kind of like the idea of the, uh, uh, the mid February Super Bowl. Honestly, it cuts down in that, like this, the dead zone of a uh, of sports time during the calendar a little bit. So why not? Yeah, well, I'm just thinking about all those coaches on the hot seat that are trying to get to eight and eight and just have that 500 record. There's no options for 500 this year. Is eight and nine going to be able to save somebody's job, you know, you know, in, in Houston or any of the other coaches that might be on the immediately on the hot seat? But um, yeah, I, I'm just shocked that, you know, the, that they just didn't try to find a way to get a second bye week because if you get like a week five or week six bye, just another week adding on, especially if you, you know, if you're the Browns, all of a sudden you have that second week in October that is your bye week and you're really having January, February playoff aspirations and you're just going to go three four straight months of games you know outside of you know whether you're going to potentially be the number one overall seed in the afc is the only way you would get the buy at that point so it's just yeah i really w wish they had an extra buy on that but maybe if they get to 18 they'll do that i don't know yeah i mean to me uh, they showed this year that preseason games weren't that important um and so this past year so you know what makes the most sense to me is to go to 18 eliminate the preseason altogether um you know and just, you know, just roll into the season going forward, uh, you know, hopefully they move a week earlier if they go to 19 or what would be 20 weeks if they put two bye weeks in. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, that seems like a more reasonable play going forward. Uh, at least then you've got everybody gets nine home games instead of eight home games one year, nine home games the next. And I don't know, mm -hmm. it just seems seems kind of strange. Uh, but um you know, like I said, more football is a good thing. I'm not going to be upset about an extra week of football to watch, but, um, 
yeah, I, I don't know. It just feels like they shoehorned it in. Yep. Yeah, and we'll definitely see how it works. But you know, let's get back to something that we're definitely um, definitely used to talking about, and that's NFL free agency. Um, so, how do you guys feel like the, you know, we we're about a month, you know, since the start of free agency, maybe around close to like three weeks or so. But how do you guys feel? Have any initial overall impressions of how things have gone? Any uh, winners or losers? You guys want to specifically focus on to to start? Yeah, I mean, I guess just as a general thought. Um, I feel like going into this free agency, there was like this giant list of um, number one wide receivers that were on the move. And that turned into be like, nope, we're just going to, this one's going to be put on, uh, uh, he's going to be franchised and this one's going to be franchised. This one's going to get a new deal at his, at his own place. And then you leave, that leaves you with Galladay uh, and uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, who apparently had no market um to so to speak and couldn't get the kind of money that was out there um for you know Kenny Dalladay is the only one of those guys that signed a giant contract uh which is kind of bizarre when you looked at the names that were on that list going into it I think if you looked at like rating boards before uh free agency started it was all like the, I think five of the top 10 players on the potential move were all wide receivers um so or five of the 10 were wide receivers and it, it just that market just went away, which is kind of crazy, especially when you think about how much talent there is in the wide receiver market in this draft. So mm -hmm. I, it's just kind of weird to me that none of these teams that, you know, could have picked to, you know, let one guy go instead of paying him a giant amount went and got, you know, a rookie. Um, but it was, a it's, that was kind of weird. Otherwise it flowed mostly like most uh, NFL free agencies do a bunch of big moves at the, in the first hour, uh, first two, three hours. And then all you know, made by the Patriots. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. The giant pocketbooks of the Patriots, which is a weird thing to say. Um, but then it slows down and then a couple of big names get moved at the, you know, once they can negotiate all the way fully. And then, you know, you wait uh, until, the right before the draft and a guy like uh Jadavian Clowney finally gets you know signed so um yeah I mean I guess that's my general thoughts before we get into uh winners and losers yeah I agree with everything Matt said there you know it was a pretty impressive free agent list and then one by one you know people re-signed and others were franchised um and then you know with the cap the the drop in the cap and the the, the, the pandemic this year I mean I think you saw a lot of uh, you saw a lot of one-year deals out there. You saw a lot of players just kind of teams all kind of just hedging, you know, waiting for next year for the, you know, cap to potentially spike with the new TV deal, um, which is, you know, outrageous um, yeah. how much money the NFL is continuing to bring in. So we're probably going to see a cap spike. So, you know, a lot of teams wanting to not like um, overcommit themselves um, uh, and a lot of players, you know, maybe taking the one-year deal um, with the hopes that they can, you know, prove it and then get a big deal next year rather than taking like a medium sized deal this year. Yeah, a lot of those, you know, whether it's Clowney, you guys talked about, you know, T.Y. Hilton going back to the Colts on a one year deal and Fournette going back on a one year deal. There's a lot of guys who just, like you said, Chris, if there's going to be a big cap explosion next year, then yeah, just take this as like a, you know, as a prove it year and, and then just, you know, see what happens in 2022 and beyond. Do you guys feel as we kind of shift into that winners and losers mentality, do you guys like the the overall concept of being like the the Washington football team of years past where they just make all these huge free agent signings and are just declared the winners of the offseason? Or would you guys rather like the in terms of your concept of team building, just be sort of like what Tampa Bay did, which didn't really sign any big free agents, but brought back all of their existing core? Which way do you guys like to do your team building when it comes to free agency? I mean, I think history has shown that the latter is the better way to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, free agency, typically, you know, this isn't baseball. Um, this isn't the NBA. Um, you know, the really, really good players don't make it to free agency. The true difference makers get locked up or they get franchised by their team. So, you know, there are a couple of, you know, really good players who do get to free agency. Sometimes, you know, teams just don't have enough money to sign everybody. The Rams for one this year and a couple others. Um, but largely the true difference makers, I mean, quarterbacks, frontline quarterbacks don't go anywhere. Frontline edge rushers don't go anywhere. Frontline receivers, frontline corners typically don't go anywhere. That's because they get locked up. So then you sort of, you have a lot of, at least historically, a lot of the big spenders in free agency are teams who are paying good players like they're great ones. Um, and as a, the fastest 
fastest ticket to cap hell um, by doing things like that. So yeah, I mean, I always, you know, they say you you build teams through the draft and you use the free agent free agency to plug one or two holes, and that kind of is historically the the way the good teams do it. Yeah, I think I mean if you're uh, the Tampa, I mean, you got to put Tampa, if we're talking, we'll start talking winners and losers. You the two teams that kind of jump out at me as, as winners is Tampa Bay is a huge winner, right? Mm-hmm. They had a team that was good, uh, very good enough to win the Super Bowl, right? Um, they brought back literally every piece that mattered uh, on that team. They did it somehow without going, without blowing up the cap. I'm not sure how that happens. They still will get some draft picks to add more talent. You know, they still have their normal draft picks to add more talent this year. Um, it's kind of insane that they that they did what they did. Uh, and then you look at a team like the Cleveland Browns as probably the other big winner uh, coming into, um, you know, out of free agency where they took, uh, you know, a couple of holes that they had filled them with the best available pet player that they could get for a reasonable amount. Right. Uh, and then took a flyer on a guy like Jadavian Colley, which if he can, if he can be even a shadow of his former self, uh, you know, but pre pre meniscus tears and pre other, you know, moving from Seattle, you know, to Sa- Seattle and all that, if he can even be a little bit of that, then it's worth it because it's a one-year deal and who cares. Right. Um, so, but I mean, I think the big, you know, their big signings, uh, you know, uh, on the, you know, the back, the defensive backfield, taking two players from the number one defense, uh, you know, from the Rams uh, at reasonable, more than reasonable cost. I mean, you compare the safety deal that, uh, that, <clears throat> oh, I'm skipping my name, Double J. Uh, it's, Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, uh, got compared to the deal that, um, you know, a locked up guy uh, at the safety position, Justin Simmons gets uh, in, um, in Denver. I mean, that's a, th- 20 million dollar difference in those contracts and for guys that are really closely rated if you look at pro pro football focuses ratings and what they can do for your team um yeah not to say that i feel like they overpaid for justin simmons but i feel like the browns really got a huge deal um which is really strange to say because cleveland has perpetually had to overpay players to come join their team um but the you know when you get to a playoff with a new coach uh, and you win a game, uh, things change, and you can see that ball rolling downhill in Cleveland real fast. And I mean, if you look at what they put together through this free agency, um, even before the draft, there's not a whole, whole lot of holes left to fill on this Cleveland Browns team. Uh, and it'll be they need some depth at some positions, uh, but otherwise, you know, if things don't pan out in the draft, they're still looking good. Yeah, and I just think kind of overall, and obviously, again, disclaimer, if this is your first time watching, Matt and I are big Browns fans, so, um, you know, we do, we, we, we do have a little homerism there, but, uh, um, you know, I think we, we've gone past the point of, of being homers, though. The Browns are good, right? Um, and you look at what they've done the last two off-seasons, coming off that really disappointing, dysfunctional 2019 with the Andrew Berry coming in as GM. Last year off-season, he basically said, I'm going to fix the offense, right? And, you know, they drafted... They signed Austin Hooper. They signed Jack Conklin. They drafted Jed Wills. They fixed a horrible offensive line and made it one of the best offensive lines in the league. So they said, you know, we're going to put all our eggs in the offensive basket this year. It worked out perfectly. They had a high flight offense. They basically rode that offense and hung on for dear life with their defense this year. And then this year in the offseason, they said the focus is going to be on the defense. He had a plan, got a great safety, added another great corner in Troy Hill, um, added a couple spots at the linebacker and D-line and then Clowney this week. So, you know, they've addressed all three levels of the defense going into the draft, really put them in a position where they don't, they're not locked into one specific position. Um, So I just think that's, you know, that's just a way better team way to build a roster than to to just scatter shot. Um, You know, if you look at it, I think Matt said, said this once you not too many teams win a Super Bowl by having the 15th ranked offense and the 14th ranked defense. Right. Usually it's your, your top five in one and like top 15 in the other. Right. Great at one and good, pretty good to very good, pretty good to good in the other. So just having that focus and going out and having a plan uh, as, is the way to approach roster building in my, my, my mind. So do you guys consider what the Patriots were doing in terms of all the signings that they have? I mean, obviously they brought Cam Newton back and bringing in John U. Smith and, and Hunter Henry and you know, a lot of very splashy um, moves that they've made. Do you guys consider them a winner as well? Do you guys like what they did? To me, it's, it's a to be determined. 
I mean, yeah. if anybody could take a bunch of, you know, people off the street and turn them into a, a great squad, um, he, the coach there has the best record of, you know, being able to make pieces fit uh, in where you don't think they would. Um, and so uh, I'm going to withhold judgment. Uh, they had a lot of money to spend. Uh, so at that point, what, what's the downside uh, to doing that? They signed some good players. Um, I mean, their, their big hole is going to be the fact that Cam Newton's their quarterback right now. Um, and, and, you know, maybe they go get one in, in the draft here. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. And then you look at teams like, you know, like Pittsburgh, which you gotta, you got to start thinking about being, besides getting Juju Smith-Schuster back on a ridiculously discounted deal because apparently there was no market for him or it wasn't yeah. nearly the market he was expecting, um, you know, has to lose a lot of good talent because they were uh, such in cap hell and the cap went down. Um, so, uh, you know, <clears throat> you get yourself in those situations by signing free agency, uh, you know, big splashy free agent signings. But I don't think the Patriots have to worry about that next year. Um, the cap, you know, just like Chris said earlier, the cap's going to go up. Right. And, and they don't have anybody they need to retain. <laughs> like when you're as bad as they were uh, yeah. on multiple levels, like, um, you know, you're not worried about having to sign your quarterback to a five-year extension. That's going to take up half of your cap. They're not there. So spend some money. Um, you know, you look around at, at, you know, some other teams that you would consider. And, you know, I guess I think Pittsburgh's a, a huge loser in this and um, you know, teams, you know, that they just, I don't know what their game plan is right now. Like, I don't know what the Falcons are doing. Uh, I, I don't know if they know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> it doesn't feel like there's any rhyme or reason to what they're doing. And then you think, you know, like, okay, so what's have a plan. Like what's Detroit's plan. Did Detroit do anything fantastic? Yeah. They, they, they loaded up on picks. They're doing the rebuild thing. Um, you know, it, but you know, if you look, I don't know, around the league, you're looking at teams like, I don't know, Seattle, you're looking at teams like, uh, what, what are you doing? What, what, did, what is, what did you do to make your team better at any level? And you, you didn't do anything. Um, and I think, you know, Seattle maybe gets a pass for that because they've got Russell Wilson and they didn't choose to trade him, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is crazy in itself. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like if you're not there and you're not winning Super Bowls and you're not pushing in free agency, then you're missing the boat. Um, you've got to try to go fill some holes and there wasn't a lot of that being done by a lot of teams that you think when you think about it, they're right there on the line of, of, you know, being good or, or great. Um, yeah, I agree there with that, with that, Matt, um, two other teams I kind of want to mention, um, one, I think had a sneaky good off season and the other, um, is going to be one of the most interesting teams, I think next year. So sneaky good off season was Buffalo. Um, you know, they didn't really have any splashy additions, but they brought back pretty much all of their free agents. And we talk, everyone talks about Tampa Bay bringing back everybody. Buffalo did a really good job in bringing back their people too. And a lot, and, you know, going into it, there was a lot of people in the media saying, Oh, they're going to lose Milano. They're going to lose some of these other players. And they were able to get it all done and, you know, brought back the core um, to a pretty good, to a team that went to the AFC championship game last year. So mm -hmm. Um, now is that enough to beat the chiefs? Um, you know, they didn't, it kind of looked like Kansas city was toying with them in that championship game. So, um, you know, they might have a team that needs, needs to hit a late round, um, hit in the draft here to maybe close the gap. But again, I think they had a sneaky good off season. Um, and then another team that I'm always, I'm going to say right now is going to be one of the most interesting teams uh, in the league this, this year. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying good. Um, they might be good. They might be a playoff team, but I think they're going to be super interesting. And that's the Arizona Cardinals. Um, they shocked everybody um, bringing in JJ Watt. Um, and then they brought in AJ Green as well. Um, and then just, they signed James Conner just this week. Um, so, you know, I mean, Arizona is where all the senior citizens go, right? That's quickly becoming the senior citizen community of the NFL as well. Um, but you got three future hall of famers at wide receiver. Um, you know, you've got a young, talented quarter quarterback, um, who I think still needs to get a little bit more consistent and, and, uh, you know, who's a little injury prone, but, um, a super exciting player. Um, and then you've got, you added future hall of famer to the defensive line. 
Um, couple that with a coach who is kind of a wild card. Um, mm. I don't, I have no idea what their record's going to be, but they're going to be an interesting team to watch. Yeah, some of the other teams that kind of jumped out to me, I really like what the Chargers did, bringing in Corey Lindsley. And, you know, we've been talking for years about how the Chargers just cannot stay healthy, especially on their offensive line. And if they're able to stay healthy and really protect Justin Herbert and, you know, I, I know they let Hunter Henry walk, but they brought in Jared Cook. I think it could probably be a pretty, you know, one-to-one -one comparison yeah. for them, you know, especially the money that they saved on that having to pay Hunter Henry as well. But, yeah, I, I think the Chargers are going to be really good again next year. Um, I think that they can re really get a chance to really make that leap to, you know, I'm not saying they're going to win the West, but they could probably challenge out there for sure, especially since nobody knows what the heck Las Vegas is doing out there. I mean, they just, Las Vegas is just a mess on so many different fronts. Um, man, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with the Giants. Like, you know, they make the, the splashy Galladay signing. They go after Adore Jackson. So, like, they fill holes, but I don't know if that team, like, really – fits i don't know what they're trying to do i don't know how good they're going to be that's that's my team chris you know you're talking about the cardinals but like the giants like yeah. especially if they're going to be getting back uh you know saquon and whatnot like they could be you know they could challenge in the east or well, and in that division you top by like, pick yeah i mean in that division like uh there's it, it's there for the taking um mm -hmm. so they had they had a pretty good defense last year they they finally got some playmakers on offense it's yeah what does daniel jones do here um in year three um, what actually team I'm going to put on kind of a sort of a negative performance in the free agency, and that's the Chicago Bears. Um, you know, maybe it's kind of <laughs> fitting that this team that has been in quarterback purgatory forever signs maybe the quintessential quarterback who's just good enough to uh, get you out of the top 10 in draft picks in, in Andy Dalton, um, you know, especially at this stage in his career. Um I don't know. It just seemed like they sort of panicked, um, you know, and it was especially with like the, the Sam Darnold trade a, a couple of weeks later um, mm -hmm. and still some other people who might be available. Um, it just kind of seemed like they said, Oh, we got to get somebody. So we brought in Andy Dalton and it seems like they're kind of just throwing the going with the throw darts against the wall for the quarterback position. And that's not a good plan um, for your quarterback position. Yeah. I mean, and you know, uh, other teams, I thought, you know, sneaky good or, or you know, underrated free agency. I thought the Bengals did a pretty good job uh, of, of kind of making their biggest problems get a little better. I mean, we'll see what they do in the draft. And if they can add a, you know, a tackle, that would be amazing. Uh, maybe some playmakers on the outside. But, um, you know, they had a sneaky good adding pieces where they need them. I um, mean, they're a young team anyway. So, you know, I kind of enjoyed what watching what what they did. Uh, and, you know, the biggest the, the biggest splashiest move maybe uh, would have been, you know, the Rams and what they did trying to get a, a, a you know, quarterback that was better than replacement level uh, than the guy that they had, you know, uh, Goff coming in, which who, who was, you know, maybe a, a bottom, you know, lower below 20 or lower quarterback in the league mm -hmm. for a team that's trying to have Super Bowl aspirations. Um, It'll be interesting. They gave up a lot to get them and they didn't read they, they lost a couple of players in free agency, but you still have um, you, ha you still have Aaron Donald. Uh, you still have some huge pieces on that defense. And if 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 this offense can click even 10 percent better uh, with Matt Stafford, they could be really dangerous. Um, well, and also on that, you have Matt Stafford, I think, playing for his legacy. Like, um, obviously, he's never won a Super Bowl. Also, I mean, you look at, you know, we had this conversation a few months ago, numbers wise, he's um, a potential, he's potentially, potentially knocking on the door of, uh, of Canton. Um, but I think if he were to retire right now, nobody's going to say Matt Stafford is a hall of famer. If Matt Stafford gets a ring or two in the next couple of years um, and continues to put up good numbers with the Rams, then it's a different conversation. So he's got reason to be motivated. Yeah, I think uh, as we kind of shift as you know, we talked about, you know, we spent so much time on previous episodes talking about the quarterback carousel and that continues um, as we kind of shift gears to talk about uh, the Panthers getting Sam Darnold. So the full trade uh, was a 2021 sixth round pick and a 2022 second and fourth round picks going to the Jets for Darnold. Um, so that means that Darnold is going to be starting fresh in Carolina, which I think, you know, I've talked about 
that in the past about how I think Carolina with a right good good quarterback an improvement over Teddy Bridgewater can be a really dangerous team. And you know, this is going to be Darnold's probably his best opportunity to make that kind of splash. How do you guys feel that the uh, the trade went down? Do you guys like the fit at all in Carolina? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I thought Sam Darnold. I mean, he's a guy I like coming out of the draft um, in 2018. I think, you know, he's underachieved, obviously, but he's been in a pretty sh- terrible situation um, with the Jets. Um, so I'm, he's still young. You know, I'm very curious to see what he's, what he's going to do here. Um, you know, I think it's a pretty good situation. He's got a, a creative coach. Um, they've got some playmakers um, with, you know, Christian McCafferty and DJ Moore. Um, also, Robbie Anderson's not a bad number two receiver there. They're in a prime position now to get another playmaker, whether that's Jamar Chase, Kyle Pitts, Jalen Waddell, um, Devontae, uh, Devontae Smith, um, you know, or a lineman, right? They're able to they'll either get someone who can protect him or another on, an offensive weapon there. Um, so he's going to have more to work with than he ever did in New York. Um, you know, they uh, Carolina immediately uh, said that they're picking up his option. Um, so that's basically like a two-year tryouts. Um, you hear some, some of the silly mock draft silly season says, oh, don't rule out a quarterback for uh, Carolina. No, the Carolina is not going to take a quarterback. They're going with Sam Darnold here. Um, and considering like, you know, where they are, if it's, if you're asking me, would you, I'd rather have Sam Darnold or roll the dice on Trey Lance. I might go with, I might try, try Sam Darnold with, with some more weapons. So I don't think it's a, a bad move for Carolina. Um, and I, for the jets, I mean, also Carolina, they got, they got him for next to nothing. So, um, why not? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the same thing can be said about what we said when we talked about Carson Wentz going to Indianapolis was if, if Carson Wentz can't make it in Indianapolis, then there's, there's no place for Carson Wentz in the NFL. And I, I think the same thing can be said about Sam Darnold. If, if you can't make it, um, with the kind of weapons they have compare, I mean, I'm sure Robbie Anderson wasn't super excited when Darnold showed up back uh, in his life, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, in general, I mean, I think, you know, they've got, they've got some pieces, you know, if, if McCaffrey can stay healthy, um, that's, that's a whole lot of weight that off of Darnold's shoulders that he's never had someone take before. So, um, you know, I don't think Darnold's a horrible quarterback. Uh, I just, I think he's never had anything to help him. Um, and not to say that just because he has stuff to help him, he's going to jump and become this amazing quarterback. But I mean, I think he's more serviceable than Teddy Bridgewater. Um, and I'm kind of with Chris, like if, if some of those guys, you know, if the fields isn't available, um, you know, depending on how far he falls in this draft, uh, you know, what's the next option, you know, you're going to take a guy in the third round and hope he pans out or, you know, what, where are you at? Um, so yeah, to, to me, it, it makes a lot of sense. The move, uh, for both sides, I think the jets had to move on and, and they're in a good position to take, uh, you know, a, a quarterback, at, you know, one of you know better quarterbacks in the, in the draft. And, um, yes, yeah, so I think it makes sense for both sides, just like the Philadelphia Wentz move made sense for both sides. And, um, I think eventually, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out where you're at and, and a new, um, you know, a new situation and new talent around you can change things. But he said, if, if it doesn't work here, sorry, Doc, yeah. this is yeah. it. They said if he, he's got a two year, two year tryout and mm. if it doesn't work, then he's going to be a backup. Yeah. We're going to have our answer about what, yeah. what Sam Darnold actually is. Yep. Um, as we kind of talked about some of the other trades, um, both Dolphins related trades um, that popped up with literally what, within like 10, 15 yeah. minutes of each other um, on the same day. So let's start with the first one with the, the Niners trade and the Niners move up to the, to the third overall pick um, with uh, taking Miami's pick that they got from Houston. So Miami got number 12, a third round pick and 2022 and 2023 first round picks back from San Francisco. Then they flipped uh, number 12. Yeah, that's right. They flipped number 12 uh, and, and a, one of those 2022 firsts and a, I think 123 overall to Philadelphia um, for the sixth pick and the 156th pick overall as well. So, you know, the Dolphins really only fell back a couple spots, picked up another first round pick for their, for their troubles. And um, it's going to be really interesting to see 
you know, what they're able to do with some of those picks. So what do you guys feel about like what's going on in Miami? I mean, obviously they signed Will Fuller. We, we think that they're going to continue to have Tua, you know, yeah. that seems going to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great move for the dolphins. Um, and, you know, fortunately for them, there were teams, this is a quarterback heavy draft at the top and their teams are always going to trade up for a quarterback. Um, um, but you know, the risk is when you trade down, you trade down too far and you miss elite players. So that's why they then rectified that and traded back up uh, to kind of lock in there at, uh, at six um, or eight. Where I, six, eight? No, it was six. Yeah, I think it's six. Yeah, yeah. yeah six. Um, and uh, so, you know, they're going to get an offensive playmaker. I think we all think it's going to be one of who's ever there of Chase, Pitts, uh, Waddle or Smith. Um, so they're going to get another weapon for Tua, which is what that team needs. Um, and, you know, with Tua, it gives Tua a chance to be the guy. And if Tua, is, Tua falls, on his fate, falls on his face this year and it turns out he's not the guy, they have ammo in future drafts to go up and get um, whoever the, uh, the next QB prospect is. So, I mean, Miami is just in that kind of rare and enviable spot of being a playoff contender who also has high draft picks. Yeah, I mean, I think this is like a masterful case of playing the board and what other people knowing what's out there, knowing that there's a bunch of quarterbacks out there and you don't you believe you don't need one. That's debatable whether you need one or not, but you believe you don't need one and going out there, moving backwards, getting a ton on that haul from San Francisco um, to go with the huge hauls you've already had from Houston and the fleecings that you've done over the past couple of years there Mm -hmm. and then just making that move probably makes that Philadelphia trade happen. Um, You know, because that takes away some of Philadelphia's capital to trade with other players, uh, other people too. Like um, if you don't know, say Miami stays at three and you know, Miami's not going to take a quarterback. Right. So um, that gives you, that's at least to get to the six, that's five quarterbacks that maximum that could go. And you know, the Cincinnati Bengals aren't going to take one. Right. So that's two, quarterbacks that aren't going to go before that so that pick that sixth round that sixth pick becomes so much more valuable to teams trying to get a quarterback then when once they make that trade to san francisco the value of that pick just went down by a lot because now you're talking about the fourth guy versus the third guy and a quarterback that lists that debatably there's two elite guys and then two maybe guys and i'm sure everybody's got those guys mixed up on their board right Mm -hmm. so that probably makes the payoff for that Philadelphia trade less. So they didn't have to pay as much to get up back that they would have had. So it all is like, it's, it's, it's a wild web. Um, but it's, it's, it's almost genius the way that they played this out by making that first San Francisco trade being uh, so ahead of the schedule of making mm-hmm. trade for picks too, to mm-hmm. make all of this happen. Um, it's kind of a genius move and it, it probably hurt teams like the, the Bengals. It probably hurt teams like, um, it probably hurt the Philadelphia Eagles, like we just mentioned. It probably hurt teams like um, uh, the Panthers too. Uh, like so, you know, it's it's a genius set of moves, really. Uh, and it, the only way it doesn't pay off is that um, they need a quarterback, and they had an opportunity to take one at three, and they didn't. Like that's the only way. But they're saying that they're they're guys to a going forward. So. Yeah, I mean, you end up maybe getting your choice of non-quarterback players in this draft. If, say, four quarterbacks go off the board and the Bengals take a, a, a tackle, like, then you still got the best player available uh, that you wanted. You get to your, cho- your choice of elite skill players, and mm-hmm. you got a first-round pick to boot. Like, it's genius. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could really see that you know, just a number of guys. I mean, obviously, if you want to hook up, you know, a Waddle or a Smith, you know, back with with Tua, you know, under the uh, Alabama umbrella. I mean, obviously, Chase would be awesome there. And they, they always, you know, even give Will Fuller on a on a prove it deal. You still need to have playmakers around Tua. But yeah, I'm just going to say, it's just, you know, and we've talked in, you know, in texts, uh, pretty much anybody, any team that takes Kyle Pitts is just going to be like, gets an a plus for me he just they just will um so i could see them doing that That would be actually be quite quite a lot of fun in miami as well but now that just means that san francisco's back on the quarterback carousel because now jimmy garoppolo's time theoretically is not going to be done in san francisco just like teddy bread rogers time in carolina should be done as well um so i mean obviously we'll talk about what we think san francisco is going to do on our next but you know 
they're not moving up to, to take an offensive lineman, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. are they going to take a quarterback? It's just a question of who, you know, depending on who you read, it's Mac Jones, it's Trey Lance, it's Justin Fields, but it's clearly going to be one of those three guys. Um, everyone has their, their, their argument on, on who's the best or who they're going to take. Um, same thing with, with Garoppolo. They say that they're, he's not going anywhere. They say that they want to do the Kansas City Alex Smith, Pat Mahomes plan. Um, we'll see. Um, they certainly could do that, right? I think Jimmy's, Jimmy's contract is, you know, the way it's the, the guaranteed, the guarantees in it are, are almost, uh, almost over. Um, so I think, you know, they, they're in a position where they could trade him and they could keep him this year and, and not, you know, not have too much dead money. Um, you know, it's, I, that's, I mean, they're a team that has Super Bowl aspirations, right? Like they were in the Super Bowl two years ago before everybody got hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jimmy Garoppolo, when healthy, has been a pretty effective quarterback for them. It's just been a question of, A, can he stay healthy? And B, has he hit his ceiling, right? So, um, you know, I think if, you know, a team that was quarter, really quarterback hun- hungry made the call, um, uh, you yeah, I'm sure they would listen to Garoppolo. Um, the other side of that is, you know, is a team that has a Super Bowl aspirations really going to throw draft Trey Lance, who started one game last year and put him in there? Or, you know, Mac Jones, who started one, one has one, um, one year as a starter, despite, you know, playing for Alabama. Justin Fields, you know, is, is a guy who um, a lot of people think could benefit from sitting a little bit, but he was a starter at least for two years. So, um, kind of depending on what happens with Jimmy is related to what what uh, quarter what quarterback San Francisco ult- ultimately likes. So th- those two things are kind of interrelated. Yeah, Matt, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, the uh, the position San Francisco has put themselves in is a great one. You know, they they get to to watch that. You know, uh, they get their choice of who they want at that quarterback position, right? Besides the two guys that are probably going to go one and two, right? So they get the next choice of the next batch. Uh, And that's an enviable position to be in versus the guy who picks after you, right? So they moved up to the right position to go get a quarterback of their future for, you know, for them, hopefully, Um, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, to to me, I, I don't know the right way to play that out. They had so many injuries last year. I don't even know what to expect from San Francisco. Um, you know, they they're, they should be reloaded, uh, especially on the defensive line uh, now that they're healthy again. Um, so everything changes once you're when you get some of those ridiculous star athletes back, um, you know, this year coming up. Uh, and, you know, that they, they have proven that they can uh, move the ball in interesting ways uh, with non elite talent. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how they, they put it together and what quarterback they decide to go with. Uh, but I wouldn't be shocked if Jimmy Garoppolo sticks around uh, and, and kind of at least starts a couple of games uh, before they, they hand the, the reins over to someone else. I mean, if he wins a couple of games and you're in the playoff hunt uh, early in the season, why make a change at that point? You know, the, the Miami deal last year with, with benching Fitzgerald kind of shows you that, you know, yeah, it's nice to get your next quarterback and get a feel of what they are. Um, but at the same point, they probably could have made the playoffs. They would have yeah. stuck with their quarterback last year. Yeah. And does that mean anything in the long run, just making the playoffs? Maybe not. And maybe that maybe Miami's going to turn out to be a genius here for doing it. But at the same time, the playoffs are just the first step to winning the Super Bowl. And if you don't do that first step, then there's no way to get the last step. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, the Patrick Mahomes situation in uh, – you know, was a little different because they took Patrick Mahomes so late in the draft. Uh, compared well, to 12, like it's not that late. Yeah, 12 is different than three, though. I mean, we can say that, you, yeah, especially when true. you trade three draft picks to go up and get the guy, well, you're in a whole different had, let's not like, like Smith, like, was playing the best football of his career. Um, in the few seasons before that, like, he had taken them to the playoffs three years in a row, so there was no reason, there was no clamoring from, from fans or media to put in Mahomes that year. They they could stick with their. Garoppolo's coming off an injury and he's been injury prone in his career. So it's not quite the same situation. Right. Yeah. It's going to be a real interesting, like all these potential over like really well-paid 
backup quarterbacks now. You know, Garoppolo yeah. is there for a couple of games and then gets benched for the number three pick. You know, same thing with Nick Foles. I mean, Nick Foles, we can debate about how good Nick Foles actually is, but he is very well paid and he's going to be behind Andy Dalton. And, you know, Teddy Bridgewater is going to be out there. Who knows what's going on in New Orleans, you know, between Taysom Hill or, you know, Jameis Winston and whatnot. So it's just a li- really weird as we continue the quarterback carousel discussions. And that's going to continue on into the draft because you're just going to be introducing a lot more quarterbacks um, to this league. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting. But as, as we kind of finish up for tonight, um, I wanted to get your guys' thoughts and feels about where we stand both, you know, from as a, as a league going into this draft in a couple of weeks, um, you know, there's a chance that this could be a lot of real good high end talent offensively, at least. And, you know, obviously on both sides of the ball, but you know, where do you guys feel that we we stand going into the draft in two weeks, two, three weeks? Yeah. It's definitely an offensive heavy draft, right? You've got mm-hmm. five quarterbacks who are probably going to go in the first round, if not in the top 10. Um, and then you've got other, you've got um, three to four wide receivers could go um, in the top 20 picks um, you've got a tight end who um, is going to go as high as any tight end has been drafted. Um, and then you've got a couple good linemen. I mean, it, you could have, you could have a situation with like 10 out of the first 12 picks, um, are offensive players. Um, and then you've got, it's a pretty good draft for cornerback. Um, there's some good corners there, not a great draft for edge rushers, um, or de- really defensive linemen. As well. I mean, there's depth there, right. But there's not that one guy. Um, who projects as a can't miss edge rush prospect. Um, I think it's a pretty solid draft for linebackers too. I mean, the linebacker position has changed a little bit. Um, you know, there's going to be, you know, linebackers are not going to be taken really in the top 10 anymore, but I do think there are some good ones in this draft. So, you know, if you're a team like the Browns um, who are almost assuredly taking a defensive player, it's actually not a bad thing to be lower in the draft because this isn't a defensive heavy draft, but the, de- the defensive prospects that there are in this draft are going to be pushed down. Yeah, I think you're going to see a bunch of offensive players go off the board in the first 15 picks and then a ton of defensive edge rushers uh, then on the way out because there's a bunch of them out there that probably would go higher any other year. Um, But, you know, like I said, when you're loaded at elite level wide receiver, uh, elite level or I mean, there's so many people that need quarterbacks and, you know, there's at least a handful of good quarterbacks coming out in this draft. Um, You put those two things together. Uh, that means that you're going to teams that are in the playoffs hunt really in the playoff hunt could be adding uh, starter potential defensive edge rushers late in the first round, which is not something you see every year. Um, mm-hmm. you know, usually those guys get snapped up pretty quick. Um, so it might be a great position if you're picking 18th uh, and you need a, an edge rusher, uh, you might go find a guy that normally would have got drafted, you know, in the top 10, uh, top 15, another year. Except though the edge rushers, I think what's challenging this year about the group of edge rushers is there's not a lot of separation between the guys. Like um, there's like four or five guys who are there, right? But there's no Miles Garrett in this draft. There's no Joey or Nick Bosa, right? You know, there's a lot of guys that you're either looking at guys like, you know, Jason Oa from Penn State who, you know, freak athletically, but doesn't have the production um, or like a guy like Russo in Miami who sat out last year, opted out. Mm-hmm. Um, or like, uh, the other guy from Miami, Jalen Phillips, who, um, had the, had the concussions, retired from football and then came back. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of quality edge rushers, um, but a lot of questions and there's not a ton of separation between the guys, which can make that a little bit challenging to evaluate. Yeah. You know, tough to evaluate, even when you are able to go see them in person. Right. Well, yeah. And then you had <laughs> yeah. the, the, mm-hmm. the scouting wasn't what it was typically, you know, this year and there was no combine. Yeah, I'm really going to be interested to see. Uh, obviously, uh, we're going to be doing a mock draft uh, episode here in about a week and a half or so on Monday or Tuesday before the draft on the 29th. Um, we're going to be doing the entire first round, right, guys? That's the plan. Yeah, that's the plan. Awesome. And you guys are going to you guys are going to have trades, right? Because that's how oh, mock drafts have to be done. Yeah, well, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, anything else you guys want to chat about before we finish up for the night? You know, the only one thing I think that that came up in the offseason and we talked about it before was uh, uh, allowing or disallowing these teams to go out and get coaches before the end of the season. And uh, I'm glad to see the NFL made that change. Uh, so they watched our video. Yeah, they, they must they have listened. Knew. They listened to me and not Chris. 
I would just, say, <laughs> dude, just delay the damn thing until the, the week before the Super Bowl or the Super Bowl's over, one of the two. I forget what exactly they decided. But either way, there's a, a moratorium on hide, hiring coaches um, in the playoffs, which is exactly what they needed to do. It's the right move, uh, mm-hmm. especially when you just look at the guys that got left on the board last year uh, because you, there's that push and that need to go out and sign somebody when you fired your coach. Um, and so um, props to the NFL for doing the right thing, even if it took them 30 years, 40 years to figure it out. They eventually come around. It just yeah. like the NFL it just takes them a while to get there. Just like, you know, that 18th game and that extra bye week. It'll probably be yeah. 20, 25, 26, 27 by the time they get there, but hopefully they'll get there. Well, they get and, to renegotiate that contract in 20, <laughs> uh, 2030. So that'll be 2030, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right guys well i appreciate you guys time as always thank you all to for everyone who's joining join in and watching us uh on youtube please make sure to like and subscribe and follow us on youtube we'll be back with another video in about a week and a half uh make sure to follow us on twitter at hark adam sports as well so for chris for matt i'm drew we'll see you guys again soon hey guys Bye. Uh, thank you